Well, hi, welcome everybody to another session in our Women Lead Online Forums brought to you by Connected Women of Influence. I'm Patty Vargas, I'm your host today. And today we have a couple of subject matter experts in the hot seat who were willing to say, yeah, go ahead and ask me anything. And in this environment, especially with what our topic is today, it's ask me anything and I'll tell you what I know and then we'll find out what we don't know together. Now our session today will last, you know, somewhere between 45 minutes an hour. And if you've joined with video, you'll be able to see our guests and our attendees alike. Questions and comments are always welcome. This is intended to be a conversation, not so much a teaching session. So let's let's get some conversation back and forth, ask questions, make comments. But if there is something that you'd like to contribute anonymously, you can put it in the chat to me and then I'll be happy to share it for you. So our topic today, as I mentioned, is a, is a very fluid one. And the title is, What Do I Need to Know About COVID-19 HR Guidelines, FMLA, Benefits, and More? And I'm so excited to be able to introduce today's subject matter experts, Tracy Ward and Erin Crable. And let me tell you a little bit about them. So first of all, Tracy is an HR executive, wave Tracy so everyone knows who I'm talking about. She's an HR executive with extensive experience in both corporate setting as well as being a consultant and has won several industry awards for HR excellence. During her career, she's implemented and developed many enriching learning and development, leadership, talent development, and benefits and compensation programs that team members value and endorse. Tracy believes that beyond helping a company achieve its growth and bottom line objectives, it's also important to make sure that the company provides a sense of purpose and inclusion and creates programs that attract, engage, and retain talent. Erin, wave your hand, Erin is an award-winning business development executive with over 15 years experience in global partnerships, unparalleled customer engagement, and innovative benefit solutions for the modern workforce. She has a successful track record in the healthcare industry by helping multiple corporations revolutionize their benefits programs and workplaces to achieve healthiest workplace awards and best place to work rankings. Following a lengthy tenure in a senior leadership role with ACI Specialty Benefits, she now serves as a consultant for corporations and organizations to implement innovative tools within the healthcare and risk management space to meet and support the goals of their business. So without any further ado, and since we've got such brilliant smarty pants here in the hot seat, I think we should kick this party off and see if we can get some information going about what in the world is going on in the HR arena uh, in light of, of this pandemic. So go ahead, ladies, one of you kick us off. What do you want to share? Erin, I know you had some information that were recent updates. Do you mind covering that to kick us off? Sure. So. Um, Employer specific, but also for every individual on the line, I just want to bring up a couple of things that have come across through the CARES Act as well as the Family First Coronavirus um, Recovery Act. And those are related to our flexible spending accounts. The first thing I want to let you know is if you have children who are no longer in childcare, um, or if you have friends with children in childcare and they are contributing to a dependent care FSA, the loss of that childcare um, or homeschooling event is considered a qualifying event to change, update, or um, completely stop your deductions for a dependent care savings account. And that's part of your flexible spending account cafeteria 125 plan. So if you are doing that, I advise you to contact your employer and stop those contributions immediately so that you're not contributing to something that you can't be reimbursed for because you're no longer paying for childcare. If at any point in time you're putting children back into childcare, paying more because you're an essential job, you can make adjust adjustments to your contribution. Those are all considered qualifying events. The second piece are what you can use under your medical FSA, your HSA, or your HRA dollars. Previously, there were some exclusions, including over-the-counter drugs without in a prescription. Now, it has, it as part of these acts and these updates, you can use your FSA, your HRA or your HSA 
for over-the-counter drugs without a prescription, which is fantastic. This is going to be retroactive to the beginning of the year, so if you have any receipts, you can use that. All the Tylenol you're purchasing, um, any sort of, again, um, actual pharmaceuticals. Now, this does not include supplements at this point in time, so that's one clarification. The second thing, which we believe will last indefinitely, which, thank goodness, is you can now purchase menstrual products under your FSA, HSA, or HRA. I mean, amen, something that women, we should have been able to do for years, but you can start using that, and that's also retroactive. If you have receipts for these products back to January 1, you'll be able to use um, your flexible spending account or healthcare savings account for these items. Wow. Boy, that's, that's timely, right? It sounds like somebody kind of slid that in as they were making some of these modifications and rightly so. That's, that's brilliant. That's great. We always hear about pork going into bills and things happening. And these are a couple of things that probably should have been in there for a long time. And amen. I mean, as women, we are spending a lot of money on these products and mm -hmm. they should be covered. And that's also for, you know, there's many medications that over the years have now become over the counter, like allergy medications. They're now going to be included in this without a prescription from your doctor. Okay, good. What about other things that, um, and this doesn't really have much to do with as far as the health spending side of it, but things that you, expenses that a parent maybe incurs because of having their children home, especially in homeschooling them, if they've had to buy supplies or they've had to um, register with certain sites and there's a fee for it or anything, any expenses that they've incurred by now being the education provider? At this point in time, there isn't anything that is shown up as a reimbursable expense associated with homeschooling. Um, we'll see if something does come up. What there is, is they do have is that you can actually take leave from your position in order to provide care or homeschool your children. Uh, we can get into the specifics of that, but that really has to do with whether or not someone's actually taking family medical leave. This has to do with your, um, your state that you live in. Um, I'm assuming most of us are in California, but there's also some leave um, that's focused in certain cities like Los Angeles and San Francisco that's specific to the area. Um, but not an expense related, at least at this point in time, I haven't heard anything about reimbursable expenses. Mm -hmm. I do think that um, it's something to consider. What I would say is if you are missing technology in terms of having access to technology, most school districts are offering checkout of things like Chromebooks or other pieces of technology for you to be able to get for your household if you don't have that available. They don't want the gap in technology to leave students behind. Mm -hmm. That's good. I also heard um, uh, there's so much coming down, you know, in terms of legislation right now and, and so many bills and amendments and things being proposed. But I did hear that one senator, and I, I can't recall if it was Klobuchar or Warren, but somebody was proposing an internet for all type of thing, you know, so that a way of expanding access for families that maybe don't even have internet in their homes, do you know, don't have access. Have you heard anything about that? I've definitely heard a lot. We're, we're in an election year, so there's a lot of conversation about things that um, were, are ideal or might be exciting or may even have traction because of our current state of emergency in this country. Mm -hmm. um, there hasn't been anything that's specifically been done from my uh, understanding. But I do know that they, um, they are special access points, and I think you have to check with your school district if there are specific places you might be able to access internet. It's very difficult because of our social distance order. Um, we don't have a place for children to go, and you know there are children who are being left at home and don't have access to any of these services, and that becomes a safety uh, concern. Um, for those of you who don't know or your employees don't know, most school districts are actually providing meal service, um, breakfast and lunch that can be picked up at certain sites. We don't want this to become any sort of a food security um, for any of those employees or any children. So these services are available, but you do have to actively look for them if you're not connected with the school district that you have in place. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does anybody I noticed have too that the, the schools have been really good about sending updates both via phone message, uh, voicemail, um, video, um, and email. So all those different forums, 
plus posting things online on their website and um, Facebook group. So I feel like they really are doing their best to communicate these different opportunities to families. Mm -hmm. yeah. Very good. Uh, does anybody online with us, do you have any questions about um, any of the, the healthcare spending accounts, any of that? Make sure we give everybody a chance. And we have dogs and children and so forth in the background. This is life, right? I mean, this is <laughs> this is the new new world order. <laughs> it is. And Patty, yeah, um, I'd like to send on that. my shoulder like on a call. <laughs> 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 it's true. And, and just to expand it just beyond even just flexible spending accounts, um, if you have any benefit eligibility questions. Um, the ability for you to extend coverage for employees who might be out on leave, for employees who are on furlough, um, there, you know, any of things like that specifically, I'd be happy to dive into that as well. Sure. Yeah. So in terms of, uh, of health care coverage, let's say, you know, we, there's very specific rules about who can be covered under your health care and who cannot. Um, is any of that being relaxed somewhat um, in, you know, I know that uh, a colleague of mine, for example, he has brought his parents in to live with him. He's also brought mm -hmm. a young adult child in to live with him. So they're all under one roof. The parents obviously have their coverage, but his adult child has no coverage um, at this point, you know, and I would imagine that that He's probably eligible maybe for Medi-Cal or something like that, but um, is there anything that you know of that's being done as far as relaxing some of those rules or expanding coverage while we're all in these strange familial relationships? Yes, so there, and it, it's not just, um, so there's a couple of different questions in the question. So for someone, for instance, who's moving into your household who doesn't have any coverage, if they are not um, eligible under your coverage or haven't recently lost coverage, um, there's not going to be a qualifying event. But many carriers, in, including Covered California, as well as other marketplace vendors, are um, having a special enrollment period right now if people would like to add coverage. They can also look into the subsidies based on what they qualify for. Um, it is very difficult to qualify for Medi-Cal, especially in California, just based on our cost of living. Um, but you, you can also look into subsidies as part of like the Families First um, or, excuse me, the Covered California going into those marketplaces. As far as employer eligibility, which is really where we've seen changes in the carrier rules as well as legislation, is that, you know, we're really encouraging employers to try to keep these employees covered. So even with a reduction in hours, uh, most of the carriers are allowing the employees to stay on the plan. You know, technically, if you are a... Um, have eligibility rules and you lower the amount of minimum hours for eligibility, you would um, have to actually change that in your plan document. And if there were employees who were part-time that now become eligible, you would have to let them know that they were eligible for coverage. Mm -hmm. So those are um, very specific. I'm probably getting into um, a high level of detail for those of you who don't have eligibility rules or aren't managing that yourself but most of the carriers have been very lax. They also have a grace period on insurance premiums for employers of 60 days. Um, they're really encouraging employers not to have any cancellations of coverage. If you are potentially furloughing employees or having a reduction in hours, there are ways for you to keep your employees covered, um, even if, you know, without having to uh, put them into COBRA at that point. So there, I would recommend if you're working with a benefits professional, please reach out. Um, if you, you know, I, I typically work with larger organizations, but if anyone who's part of CWI who is on here has any questions, I would be happy to look in, in detail for you later, um, because every employer, and especially with some of these mandates, it isn't as cut and dry, um, mm -hmm. depending on where your employees are located, where you're located. Most of the mandate order is for employers under 500. That includes the, the sick leave requirement and the extension of FMLA due to the care of a child who's no longer in school. Um, those are for 500 and under, and then under 50, there are specific things that can make an employer exempt, and it has to do with a qualification made by the C-level executive on their ability to stay in business or to perform the work that they need to do. Um, and we can help you get those 
to that information if needed. Okay, great. If, if we could, I want to shift gears just a second um, to talk about reduction in force or um, temporary layoffs or furloughs or whatever, whatever the option is to an employer. Tracy, can you speak to some of that about what can an employer do? What are they facing? What are the, the pros and cons of, of any of those choices? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This has been a, a big topic recently for a lot of companies in evaluating how can they create an environment that's sustainable for their organization long term. And so some of the considerations that I've seen have been to look at a reduction in pay. Sometimes that's a flat dollar amount across the board or percentage across the board. And sometimes I've seen that tiered where the senior leaders are actually taking more of a reduction than other members in the workforce, um, understanding that people need to be able to survive financially and they're not wanting to cut individuals too much that are um, lower wage earners. And I think that goes a huge way to the culture of the organization and really showing that the leadership is doing their best to take care of the individuals in the company. In some cases, I've seen that arranged as a deferral where the monies are intended to be paid back at a later point in time. And in other cases, it might be a reduction just in salary or it could be a reduction in salary and hours. So in the case of a reduction in salary and hours, that does allow the individual the opportunity to file for a partial unemployment claim. So for the amount of the reduction, they can uh, apply for unemployment and then the, the company would verify the reduction. Um, in other cases, companies have been evaluating furloughs, and that term has a really wide range of uses. So in some cases, furlough can be um, used to define reduction in hours. In other cases, it can be used to define um, complete removal of any hours worked. And in some cases, it could be over a longer term period, which essentially then can mean uh, basically a layoff, a removal from active payroll and separation from employment, but it could mean the intention is to return the individual at some point. It may just be that that's undetermined. Um, going to, to one thing that Aaron had mentioned about employers sometimes furloughing individuals, I have seen where employers are often looking to see if they can continue the benefits for a period of time. And it's a really nice gesture, understanding that right now health benefits in particular are something that um, it's really critical and of importance to individuals, especially given you know, health um, circumstances that can come up. And so being able to have the continuation of that um, for a period of time also gives individuals at least some level of security that they feel like they're being taken care of and are likely to then be recalled at a later point in time. Mm -hmm. So that's one way that I've seen um, companies take the strategy of let's give individuals some peace of mind um, by extending certain things beyond what is legally required for them to do. Um, I think it's important to note that if you are removing an employ employee from payroll, um, you would want to go ahead and pay out accrued vacation so that you're not holding on to that. Um, and that's something that, you know, is important. Even if you're intending to bring them back to work and you're not terminating employment, if they're not working, you still want to give them that option to receive accrued pay. Well, that's amazing. I, I had no idea. I, um, like you said at the beginning, I had always assumed that furloughed versus laid off, um, that furloughed implied that employee will be brought back. So it, it kind of it still kept that employee-employer relationship. Um, so it sounds like maybe that's not as cut and dried as I, as I thought. And then also having the option of paying out their accruals, um, you know, that sort of, you know, it, to me that would have implied we're severing this relationship. But not so if if what you if I understood what you said correctly. Right. And it, it does vary. The interpretation of furlough and how that's applied within organizations um, really does vary quite a bit. And I think even if you talk to employment attorneys, their definition of how long a furlough can 
can take is, is also varied. So you typically um, used to see that a furlough was usually only a few weeks, and then there was a defined date for someone to return to work. Um, now you're seeing that that date is kind of getting pushed. I would say generally still um, within a few months, maybe a three month period roughly, but there are some organizations that are asking, can we consider it a furlough and have the person be gone for an undefined number of months because we don't know when we would be, be able to bring them back. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of pushing the envelope where that typically would have been looked at as a layoff, mm -hmm. but organizations are, are looking at it a bit differently depending on their circumstances. Great. Do, uh, are there any questions from our audience here? I want to make sure I give you all a chance to, to jump in because I have a million questions. <laughs> Okay, so one question I have, uh, if an employee is furloughed, can they look for other work? Can they take other work or would they have to separate with the previous employer before they took that other work? So normally in a furlough situation, the idea is that the work will be um, available just at a later point. And so that really is one distinction between a furlough and a layoff. Um, during a, a furlough, if the idea is that the person is only temporarily removed from payroll, unemployment or EDD generally does not require that they um, prove that they're seeking other employment. Uh, distinction would be if there is a layoff, it might be undetermined on whether the person would be brought back. That could be uncertain and the company may not be able to make that guarantee. And in that case, EDD is typically going to have the individual show that they are seeking alternate work. Okay. But they're right. under, I apologize, an add-on to that. There's, there's no contractual obligation, though, on behalf of the, the employee to remain available in that situation, though, correct? That is my, my understanding is, you know, the company would offer that. Um, Certainly, it would be up to the individual, but then um, depending on that circumstance, you know, if they're not available, they would certainly have an obligation to have that dialogue with their employer. Great questions. Any other thoughts on this? Just to also let you know, if you do um, seek other employment, you absolutely can when you're on furlough. There's nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, consider it like any other separation. If you were to accept it at another employer, you would be making that separation with your employer. Mm. Okay. I have to stay muted, you guys, because my dog barking at every time that he, she hears. But um, I do have a question, but I'm not sure this is the right. I apologize in advance. Um, but you were talking about the reduced hours or reduced payment and um, that you can apply, I think what you said was you could apply for unemployment um, for a portion, was that correct? Is that what you said? Yes, if, if there's a partial reduction in salary and hours, then um, you would be able to apply for unemployment for um, that, that portion, the variance, essentially. So, so if you, your hours so my follow -up, were reduced. Sorry, my follow-up on that was just if, do you know if that applies for anyone that is in the gig world or 1099 world? And those that, for me personally, I'm, you know, I've lost some contracts. I haven't lost all income, but I've lost a partial part of my income. Is that something that I can apply for as well? That was kind of my follow-up to that. Sure. Um, so the, the, the rules around the CARES Act did include that there is um, ability for self-employed individuals and gig workers to apply for unemployment. I think what has happened is because the um, state unemployment systems typically are hadn't been set up to capture that type of data, they are playing catch up in structuring some of the questions and the format of how that information will be collected and um, the basis of having to make the determination on income. Um, so some of that is a bit unclear. If you go to the um, unemployment website and you're looking for that information, um, there 
saying that they still will need to provide some further details about that. Yeah, I actually um, filed the other day because as a, I, I have both W-2 and 1099 work and the 1099 work is gone. It's completely dried up, you know, for, for the foreseeable future. And so I did, you know, I, I don't like filing for, for anything. I don't like having to interact with the government in terms of forms because I think they know too much about me as it is. <laughs> so it's just a personal thing. But I did go on and, and file for that. And it was, it was sort of an abbreviated form instead of all of the other data that you have to put in typically if you're, you know, if you've been separated from a W-2 employer. Um, it, it wasn't horrible. It was okay. I'm just, you know, like Tracy said, I'm expecting for a follow-up because it didn't seem like enough information was provided to them that would allow them to make any kind of a judgment about, you know, what, what it should be. Okay. Thanks, you guys. Yeah. And I think one other um, element that's important if, if you're an employer is that you, even though individuals can apply for unemployment, it's not up to the company, your, your own organization, to say whether or not the person will be eligible, because a lot of that is going to be based on, you know, their compensation over time, how much have they play, um, paid into unemployment, um, you know, earnings, there's so a lot of different factors. So eligibility um, is, you know, so case by case, um, it's really important that companies are not counting on certain dollars being made available when they're not the ones actually making that approval. Mm -hmm. I liked what you said, Tracy, about um, what employers were doing in terms of, of trying to take care of their employees and, and how it kind of reflected on the culture of the company um, because when this is over and this will be over um, you know companies will hopefully want to bring people back or they're going to want to hire and and I keep thinking back to 2008 when some employers were were very cold and bottom line driven about the situation and um, I remember having, I was working in corporate at the time, and I remember having a conversation with, with a senior leader and, and said, people have very long memories, you know, and this, mm -hmm. <laughs> they will remember this. They will remember how they were treated. They will remember how they felt. Um, not 2000, I'm sorry, 2004, when, when we had all the dot-com blow-ups and things. And, you know, I, um, and it was true. You know, the minute jobs became available, people were, were fleeing, you know, uh, the sinking ship basically because they could go elsewhere. You know, this, this same senior leader had said to me, well, where are they going to go? Fine. They're unhappy. Big deal. Where are they going to go? Yeah. As soon as they could, they did. So I think the way that we treat our employees right now is, is, uh, especially in something like this where it's, it's such a humanitarian crisis, you know, is going to go a long way toward employee retention and, and the resilience of the company and their ability to bounce back. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I, I see the organizations that are being really transparent and having communications and, and opportunities to have dialogue with their teams. They're the ones that have built, I think, the strongest loyalty and great faith in the leaders because they are hearing the communication direct from the CEO, direct from the leadership team. They understand all the efforts that are being made and they understand that the choices that are being made are being done in order to protect the long-term future of their employment and the organization mm -hmm. and to make that sustainable. Yeah. So I have really seen that this is a time when having that transparency and being truthful about, you know, the hardships the company is facing, it really can rally the team to help have all of the individuals look at how can I contribute to this? What are ideas that I have or ways that I can, you know, help with customer retention or um, reduction in operating costs or different things like that? Mm 
And um, I've really seen that even in situations where sometimes, you know, changes have had to been made through um, reductions in pay or what have you, because of the honesty and transparency and the way that that's been communicated, people have really um, understood it and accepted it and have asked, what else can I do? And so they've not taken it as a negative. They've actually looked at it as, I understand why the company is doing this. I understand that I don't want my job or my coworkers jobs to be affected. And I can believe in the direction that we're going in. And mm -hmm. that's huge. Yeah. Yep. Very much. Um, Aaron, can we go back a minute to, um, you, you started to touch on this and, um, but I'd like to dive a little bit deeper into FMLA and what is available to people now because it it always uh, seemed before like it was very specific it was only for this or this or this you know but um, people are probably getting pretty creative about how to use those services and benefits now so there are, there are a couple of things um, it isn't just fmla because we've got the sick leave um, that was part of the you know, families first and the the care act and um, the, the thing I'd like to put people in is two different buckets. There's folks who are sick or quarantined, and then there's folks who are caregivers. Those are taking care of um, someone who's ill or taking care of children who are no longer in school. And so because of that, we have our, the sick leave, which is under sick or quarantine person, is 100% pay up to $511 a day, which is up to $5,110 total. Um, and this is a tax credit that comes back to the employer if the employer covers this portion, okay? And that's, um, it reimburses the sick leave and the enhanced FMLA, which we'll talk about in a moment. Um, it also can be used by the employer for tax credits under, um, for health care insurance costs, and it's offset through the payroll taxes. So when we've got our sick and quarantine people, for those first two weeks, it's that 100% pay, as I mentioned, but they do not have any advanced FMLA um, coverage beyond their two weeks of the sick leave under that particular order, they can then file for paid family leave through the state. If it's a caregiver, the, um, the leave is two thirds pay up to $200 a day or $2,000 total for the first two weeks. And they do have enhanced FMLA for weeks three through 12. And that's at two thirds pay as well. The employer does require, you do need documentation. You'll need the names and substantiation or reason for that. Um, in your records at this point in time, they're not having you actually, they haven't said what will be required to send in, but you'll just need to make sure you have a record of those bits. Um, those are the two pieces that have been, um, been part of those two acts. And then, um, you know, we talked about unemployment briefly and also I want you to know that the waiting periods in the state of California have been eliminated. But like any system that has become overwhelmed, you know, uh, I've talked to employers in the last couple of years about the unemployment system and paid family leave, and there was a delay before all of this. Yeah. So as you can imagine, employees and individuals are going to experience um, delays in administration. You know, we've all seen some of the things on, on the news about certain states and New York in particular that has a lot of significant um, challenges in distributing. And if you have employees in other states, there's, there are additional measures. Um, if you have employees in Los Angeles or San Francisco, there's also um, things that you might need to look at for that particular area as well. Yeah. Um, a couple of times you've mentioned, Erin, the Family First Act. Can you, what is the Family First Act? I've heard about CARES, but I haven't heard about Family First. So um, the Families First Coronavirus um, Recovery Act came before the CARES Act, and this is that initial mandate, and that was focused on the testing covered at no cost um, and cost, you know, the, the, the cost of care. Um, the CARE Act came in from a COVID-19 perspective and added the, the, any additional cost of tests or qualified preventative services. Um, within 15 days of recommendation, and that's for all health plans. So the reason that that was significant is that prior to this legislation, if you were on a high deductible health plan, um, you couldn't have services like telehealth or um, um, testing covered at 100%. You, 
you had to utilize your deductible first. And otherwise, it wouldn't qualify for a healthcare savings account plan. And they went and just eliminated that completely, which um, it's great. This, this covers not only self-funded, um, but also fully funded and fully insured plans. So the plans have all been required to cover all of these services. Interestingly enough, and this is maybe the benefit nerd in me, but you know, we're looking at this just in terms of um, what it's going to cost us. And I've seen some incredible data on the fact that the actual healthcare costs for self-insured groups who are paying claim for claim um, are going to see less expense very likely unless we hit a catastrophic level of infection in the United States because regular surgeries and routine work have essentially been halted completely. And so there's a lot of things that won't be actually covered, you know, that they won't actually incur those costs. So it's going to be an interesting look. If you imagine a bell curve coming across at what you're going to have in terms of COVID costs and um, of, of testing, and obviously the intensity of some of the illness is going to have certain high claims, and that's going to be organization to organization. But we all know that the money has to come from somewhere, and the government isn't necessarily reimbursing for some of these services. Um, some of them will be, and it's at a standard rate, which doesn't always work across the entire country. Mm -hmm. So we'll all end up paying to some degree, but what that looks like may actually be um, a bit delayed um, because we have so many of those routine surgeries um, that are a significant portion of what our healthcare costs delayed. Yeah, it's, it's so good to have you nerds on here. <laughs> because this is so in-depth and so confusing, you know, and um, people don't necessarily know what's available to them either. You know, they, you know, I've heard so many people make blanket comments about this old information, the way it used to be, you know, and, and not realize that things have changed and that there is a lot very positive that's going on out there in terms of changing our access and, and what's available to us and understanding about things that might be relaxed or expanded and changed, so. Just to kind of add on to that, you know, I want to encourage anyone who's working with professionals to reach out and get their help. You know, for instance, I focus really in the benefits realm and I um, dip my toes out into the HR just because it is is the industry that I work with directly, but I also have, you know, folks that I consult with. So having someone like Tracy, who has that HR knowledge and really the expertise, she's really the type of person that I reach out to when it's something outside of really that benefits piece. And if she needs something more specific, you know, she has the contacts that can really hone into that piece of it. The most important part is as an employer, you know, you may think it is one thing or another, but you do have to make sure that you are notifying your employees um, about these changes. We talked about um, the addition of covered COVID um, testing as well as any services or that are, and preventative, which by the way, the qualifying preventative service is probably gonna be vaccine. That's usually what it'll end up becoming. Um, but you need to make sure that you are notifying your employees of disability. Plus most of the carriers are including uh, low or no coverage um, telehealth services for people to access care from home. Again, they, you do need to provide your employees notification that this is available to them. And since posting it is one option but may, may not actually be practical for notification, employers are required to be emailing their employees and letting them know about these updates. Mm. Uh, if you have any questions, even if you have a carrier that you want information, I have I'm sure um, most of us are getting a million emails from anyone I ever gave my email address is telling me what they're doing about COVID-19 right now. Um, this level of detail is a little bit alarming, but if you need help drilling it down, I have most of the carrier um, Q&A and FAQs and information for you to be able to share with your employee population. Erin, why don't you give us your email and I'll put it in the chat box here real quick. Sure, it is Erin underscore Crable, K R E H B I E L, at AJG.com. AJG.com, yes. And um, just below that, if you would like, um, I if you'd like to put this web address in there, because we have a public pandemic preparedness and COVID 19 resource website that any of you can go on to and look at our resources at any point in time. They're updated daily. 
and that is at ajg.com slash pandemic dash preparedness. Okay, check my, uh, what I've got there. I've got your email wrong, I can see already. So it's Aaron. Um, the, the web address, yeah, the web address is going to be a dash instead of a slash in between pandemic and preparedness. Okay, I'm batting a thousand here. <laughs> All right. Email's right. Yay. Yay. <laughs> so it's ajg.com slash or dash? Okay. Slash pandemic dash preparedness. Bingo. All right. That's Nailed perfect. it. <laughs> and Tracy, and how about how, how can folks reach you? My email is tward. T W A R D at forward talent strategies.com. And I think, um, you know, right now, this is a really great time to promote your employee assistance program or utilize that personally if you have a need. I think right now individuals can be feeling overwhelmed from a, a multitude of things, whether that's financial stress or mental emotional um, stress. And you know, your your own mental health is so important, and that of your family members. And a, a typical benefit that is often um, provided as part of health benefit plans includes the employee assistance. And it's a really nice thing to push out to your employees as a reminder to take advantage of that resource. Mm -hmm. I'm glad you said that because um, I was going to mention that even from my healthcare provider, I got an email that had a, a long list of um, mental health resources and wellness resources and things that was, was just so beneficial, you know, so remembering to reach out to your your benefits provider in your workplace or, or your health care provider. Um, I think everyone is realizing this is a whole person type of, of mm -hmm. pandemic. Right. So yes, just and Tracy, that's an awesome point. I want to expand to just to let you know many EAP carriers as well as health providers who provide mental health services as part of parity are offering it in a telehealth format as well. Um, so you don't have to just um, try to actually see the provider. So it's an oftentimes an easier way to get to those benefits. Small employers, you may actually, if you don't have a, a set or a freestanding EAP, you may have an EAP that's included as part of your ancillary coverage, your life, um, your life and um, LTD coverage that your employer provides. There's oftentimes a bolted on EAP product, so reach out to your HR person. That's great. Does anyone have any any final questions for Aaron and, and Tracy? This has been incredibly enlightening. Okay, any final words from you ladies? Anything that you would like to leave us with to make sure that we remember maybe final tips that we should take? Um, I would say communication is just really important. And as Erin was mentioning, um, reach out to your resources. Um, I think during this time, um, a lot of individuals and companies are really looking to provide value and provide support. And so there are, there's a lot of free information available and a lot of great resources. And it's just tapping into the right people that can sign you up for lists or get you access to webinars and great information from subject matter experts. So that is really important. But I think also um, making sure that you are communicating and partnering with important people, like utilizing someone like Aaron, who can be a great resource, but also to avoid a mistake where you hadn't communicated something that you were doing to a critical party. So an example being if a company is looking to continue benefits for individuals that are furloughed, that's a, a conversation that should take place with your broker and the carrier needs to be informed. So you don't want to be making those decisions on your own without communicating with really important parties. I would say that's one of the biggest takeaways. Great. Excellent. Erin, how about um, you? Thank you, Tracy. 
Yeah, I thank you. I, I appreciate, you know, the questions that have come across. And if there's any way that any of us can help you with any specific questions, I think it's important to consult with professionals. When it comes to, if you, you know, if you're qualified plans under ERISA, there are a lot of compliance issues with making some of these changes or making these decisions that you have to actually make on your plan document. And so some of the things that we mentioned today that you, you I would just make sure you're um, dotting your I's and crossing your T's because with employees that are potentially being re reduction in force, reduction in hours, reduction in pay, um, there will be attorneys out there looking for ways to sue employers. Um, even in these situations, as sad as it seems, um, we will see an influx in, in cases that are going to be related to um, COVID-19 and, and this healthcare crisis in general with the stay in place order. So just be careful, make sure that when you are doing any sort of a layoff that you have all of your paperwork. Tracy mentioned paying people out for their vacation or their um, sick time, you know, not ha doing that in a timely manner, not providing documentation on access to care, health care, et cetera, um, could put you in, in danger of a employee, employee lawsuit. And I, I would hate to have any of our members with that. Um, the resources that we put online, again, if there's any way we can be of help. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, my day-to-day -day prospecting activities have come to a halt because I think it's largely in, inappropriate to really be pushing um, specific services in our time right now, but I have been able to help a lot of um, people that we work with and people that are uh, even prospective clients. And, and to me, that fills my day and actually brings some value. And I think that um, if we can contribute, you know, and, and reflect that out to the universe, that we'll see that back in return. And the same with our, our family. Um, we had some wonderful messaging last week from a corporate level from our HR member. Um, leader that said, take a pause. Um, everyone deserves to give themselves a pause, give their families a pause, look around and realize how fortunate that we are. Um, this, we have no idea what it's going to do to our economy, but that's something that's outside of our control right now. So the decisions we make and the people that we reach out to and have um, strong bonds and relationships, I think are going to, um, we're going to remember this. We are all going to remember what we were doing during this time. And I hope that we'll all be able to leave a really positive stance. That's brilliant. That's beautiful. What a great way to end the conversation because it's, we will be remembered for how we showed up how we handled ourselves, how compassionate we were, and the relationships that we maintained or didn't during this time. So, well, I want to thank my two subject matter experts for coming online with us today and, and providing such great, timely, and important information. And this session is recorded, so even if you were not here live, you've got great information to look back on and refer to please feel free to reach out to Aaron and Tracy if you've got any questions about any areas around this. That's, that's what we're all here for. We're all better together when we serve one another and we offer ourselves up. So everyone stay safe, be safe, and, and just go out there and, and love one another and take care of one another. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.